All right, very good. Maybe I could get all our panelists here to turn on their uh, video and audio as well. So as you just heard from Todd, you know, modern construction brings three things together on a foundation of operation science. And, and these are the basics that are mastered in any efficient manufacturing industry, autos, electronics, consumer products. And this modern construction requires a fresh approach, which really has some big implications, big changes in our industry. And we tapped a, a group of panelists today that I'm really excited to, to have here. And they're all on different points on this journey to modernize construction but I think it's important to understand their perspectives and uh, what they've learned along the way. So let's get started by first uh, getting to know them a little bit. I'm just gonna handle it in alphabetical order. Dick, maybe raise, raise your hand there. Dick is a vice president of Collier's Project Leaders. He's a licensed attorney, having practiced construction law in Colorado, California, Idaho for the past 45 years. He's been around the block, even a little bit more than me. He's internationally recognized as an integrated project delivery and lean leader for his work with the Realignment Group in Canada and Collier's Project Leaders. Dick was the first executive director of the Lean Construction Institute and has served on uh, many different boards in diverse industries. So Dick, thank you for your time today. Let's move, on to, Dave. Let's move on to Dave Connell. I've got two Daves on the panel, so I'm gonna have to uh, resort to last names here shortly. So Mr. Connell. He's a project execution consultant at Chevron, working to modernize Chevron's project system to encompass operation science, digital systems, and standardization, as well as supporting ongoing projects. Dave, too, has been around the block for a little bit of time, 40 years in the industry with Chevron, working in a wide variety of roles in all kinds of projects and all phases of development, both in the U.S. and internationally. His project experience includes in the industry, industry, upstream, downstream, fertilizers and chemicals. So he's, he's well-traveled and been around the block as well. So Dave, welcome. Jan, you're next in the queue. He's with McKinsey and Company. Uh, Jan is a partner at, at McKinsey in Amsterdam. He brings extensive experience in improving capital productivity and capital investments, particularly in the energy and material sector. His experience includes working with, an, for example, an Asian shipyard, to strengthen late stage construction execution for an offshore mega project with improvement over 50% in prioritized productivity metrics within the first three months. So this guy knows how to get results. He holds a master's of science in aerospace engineering in design and production of composite materials. That's pretty cool. From Delft University and an MBA from NSAID. He is also a member of the European Construction Institute's Project Delivery Direction Group. Thank you, Jan. Dave McKay. Dave recently retired as Vice President, Well Factory Execution Bakken for Hess Corporation. In this role, Dave applied lean philosophy to develop a well factory assembly line from initial scoping of wells or drilling and hydraulic fracturing to the handover to production. Pretty cool. He's, a, he's an innovator and a leader in his own company and helping modernize construction of field development. Prior to joining Hess, Dave spent 13 years in area energy. Early in his career, he spent 16 years in various production operation roles with Mobile Oil Corporation. So again, another guy that's been around the block, he holds a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from the University of Colorado in Denver. Thank you, Dave, for your time. Xavier Sakhar, there we go. He's responsible for construction and infrastructure activities at the Arab Shipbuilding and Repair Yard Company, or known as ASRI. This includes ship construction, offshore construction, pressure vessel building, and construction of ASRI's first in indigenously designed multi-role landing craft. I've got to see a picture of what one of those looks like, Xavier. <laughs> he has also implemented various infrastructure projects which have improved energy efficiency in his company. In his working career of 36 years, he spent over 12 with uh, Classification Soy Society Lloyd's Register and 24 years in shipbuilding and ship repair yards. He's been involved in design, production engineering, and construction of various ship types, including 60 vessels during the boom period of 2005 to 2010, many of them being first in class. So this guy's an innovator as well. 
He's a graduate naval architect and received postgraduate diploma in business management. So as you can see, we've got a, an incredibly experienced and, and deep knowledge base here for us to share with our audience. So let's let's get the ball rolling with, the, with some good questions. We're gonna start with you, Jan. At McKinsey, you're well positioned to see kind of the big picture of the state of the construction industry globally. So what's your perspective on the broader industry need and urgency to modernize and how big and important is the problem? Thank you, Gary. And thank you to all of you at PPI for, being, for the honor of being able to be with you today. Look, I wanted to get back to the number that you were mentioning, right, the 13% of GDP. If you look at what's happening now globally you know, with COP going on and also the uh, need uh, to basically provide for real estate and infrastructure for a growing population, there's a tremendous capital spend out there, right? As you said, it's between 10 to 12 trillion a year. And we actually did a survey last year where we, where we uh, in, uh, surveyed 300 you know, decision makers, CXOs, top executives on their perspective on the need and urgency to transform the industry. And that probably might be a little bit more interesting than my personal one. And 75% of those responded that there was a, you know, a, a need to either sit, uh, partially or completely re redesign product delivery, mm -hmm. right? And the survey also indicated that there was a shared perspective that the impact potential of doing the modernization construction could yield you know, 30% more on cost and more on schedule, a uh, faster schedule. Now, if you put those two together in terms of the investment need that we need to do to achieve net zero by 2050 and the need to modernize and increase the real estate and infrastructure, if you put those two together with a 30% impact potential, it would mean that what we can achieve in 10 years, we can actually achieve in seven, right? It also means that what would cost society you know, 10 to 12 trillion a year, yeah? Or it could cost, you know, less than that, eight or nine. If you put that together with some of the numbers that are being put out there on what the additional cost for net zero is by 2050, which is around three to four billion a year, right? If we would be able to modernize construction, we could A, deliver net zero by 2042 and make it cost neutral to society, right? So from a potential societal benefit that we can bring as an industry in addition just making our lives more pleasant generally right i mean that's a whole different thing to say but it's like the impact potential we have is absolutely huge and that in itself for me is 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 personally most motivates me to say that i see you know a real need and an urgency to modernize yeah that, that's really insightful so 10 years to seven years. Uh, who was the survey of? Uh, the survey was people in the, in the construction industry. So we okay. talk about, you know, product directors, executives responsible for capital projects, okay. product managers, uh, but both from owner organizations and contract organizations and suppliers. So yeah. it's really a very broad survey. Yeah. That's excellent perspective. So big and important, important to society, important to the world economy. Absolutely. Xavier, uh, let's move to you. You people don't always think about shipbuilding and repair as as you know as an important part of the equation, but you, you know it, it is a serious issue and it's, it's really important. And shipbuilding is something a little bit closer to what I would think of as a manufacturing situation, but repair, man, that's that's wild. That's totally full of surprises along the way, and you got to do work to find out what work you need to do. Do you see a need for a modernization of shipbuilding and repair? First of all, Gary, thank you very much for having me and thanks to the organizers. A very, very relevant question, Gary, and there's no doubt about it that ship repair poses surprises all the time. However, if you have to make your job safe and less expensive, that's the need of the art today. Otherwise, you would just fall back both in terms of safety and price. I'm talking safety in particular because of repair. You know, repair, like it's like when you get a tanker to a shipyard, it's like a bomb next to you. So you have to be good in terms of doing things safe. And if you don't do things at a lower price, you're out of the game. 
Secondly, you have so many tools available today like never before. You can handle terabytes worth of data. You have sensors, scanners. You have 3D visualization aids, softwares like never before. You have portable gadgets which can be used to monitor a job from home, from office, from the ship, wherever you want to, away from the ship. You have machines to cut, bend, form numerically through computers. Well, and most importantly, you've got people who like to embrace technology. We will also find it difficult to find skilled people, traditional shipbuilding or ship repair people slowly. So the short answer to your question is yes, we have to modernize. We don't have a choice at all. Mm. Very, very well put. You have to, you just don't have a choice. It's here. Excellent. Well, Dave, I, I mentioned your, your, your pioneering work with, with PESS. I ask you a little bit different kind of a question. Why did you start this journey to modernize construction within HES? <clears throat> was that just a HES thing or is that an industry wide? Well, thanks, Gary. Uh, thanks thanks to, to, for the invitation from you and from PPI in general to participate in this discussion. It's really important. You know, uh, actually, you mentioned that that my work with Hess was uh, preceded by by my work at Era, and that was actually the first place I encountered some of these kind of concepts and and the need to do this. Where I was not out of the traditional project uh, realm, I was actually in more in the operations and production realm of mobile oil, and then Era at that time, but but charged with a daunting process of putting on uh, drill, drilling and putting on production a thousand wells, uh, relatively shallow wells, but a thousand wells in one year in the Bell Ridge oil field. And so that level of activity was such that uh, my first attempts were to, you know, to learn as quickly as possible on a very steep learning curve. Uh, the concepts of, you know, conventional production management, critical path management. And, uh, you know, I built out all the tools and and, and uh, played like I was actually uh, somebody who was going to actually manage this project. And I think I was struck very quickly because of perhaps just the nature of this kind of a project with the fact that I couldn't use S-curves to kind of explain away why things were progressing the way they were. I was supposed to be putting on production on a continuous basis throughout the year. And that production was not coming on because despite my best efforts, you know, using conventional methodologies, the work in the field was in a state of chaos. You know, we weren't managing the production, as has been mentioned a couple times there. The the day-to-day -day operations of all the many facets of uh, facilities and subsurface work and, and all the coordination that had to go on in planning and design and all of that was happening really un, unmanaged to be quite honest, and was resulting in a state of chaos that, that uh, not only was I not meeting any of the production quotas that I was required to be meeting, but you know, there was uh, real concerns for safety and, 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 and chaos in the field that was creating situations that were just untenable. So, so I, you know, I was fortunate to, to come across some of these ideas that had first come out of Obviously, <clears throat> manufacturing, as has been mentioned earlier, and, and other sectors of the, the industry, that, that they were managing this production on a, on a much more kind of specific level. And, and this kind of this, this concept of applying lean concepts and then really kind of going deeper than what I would call conventional lean down into the operation science was something that people like uh, James Chu and, and Iris Tomlin and Glenn Ballard helped me with early on at ERA, and then we transferred that same concept to uh, when, I, when I went with Hess to the Bakken project, where, again, managing production and, and, and utilizing some of what we know now works in other sectors of industry made the whole well factory concept a much more viable idea so so that that's kind of where that's kind of where i came from on all of this and i think you know i think i'm <clears throat> I'm, I'm 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 convinced now that if you don't understand the underlying operation science and you're not using 
these principles that Todd has talked about that that you will result in chaos, whether it's in a well factory or if it's in construction of an LNG plant or a commercial building somewhere. So born out of the chaos of work. That's that's what happened to all my hair. <laughs> <laughs> Very insightful. Dick, you come at this from a totally different, pers unique, unique perspective. I'm anxious to hear uh, your thoughts on, you know, does the building sector need to modernize? How, how important is that? How urgent is it? Well, thanks so much, Gary. Thanks for having me. Like everybody else, I'm really honored to, to be on this panel. And I share so many experiences with the, the folks on the panel. I was a deckhand on a workover rig in Wyoming in 1971, and I owned a company that did 2,000 barrels of 17 gravity oil in Los Angeles a month. And I went to the University of Colorado, Dave, so I'm a golden buffalo myself, having been a born and bred in Denver. So thanks for having me on the panel. And, and I, the, the, the real topic, I think, Gary, from my perspective is is not just commercial building, you know, so much of the work that we do is in, is in institutional building. So colleges, universities, in municipal infrastructure like bridges, community centers, we're into, you know, most of the medical field with hospitals and clinics and those kinds of things. And that, that institutional work is supported by tax dollars and is supported by growth in communities and, and has a huge impact on how, how communities respond, how they grow, whether they are you know, isolated and gated communities, or we're really talking about how to kind of rebuild a sense of community in the world. And so I'm, I'm completely convinced that what, you're, what, we're, what we're calling modern construction, I'm loving that. I'd love to get to postmodern construction, whatever that might be. But certainly the idea of challenging the, the institutional approach that, that contractors especially have, have had to, to the business where they just don't think that they're in the, in the production business. They think that they're in the managing P6 and, and diving deep into estimation software. They're in the business of creating assumptions and being surprised that those assumptions don't come true. And it, it really is. It, it really is that point in the Thomas Kuhn cycle where you talk about the model is not only drifting, but the model is under so much pressure that you really need to rethink it. And the difficult thing is, is divesting some of these much, you know, these giant construction companies from their investment in P6 and critical path and, and all the rest of that stuff is getting them out of that so that they can see that what they are is a facilitator of production. You know, most of these large contractors really don't do any work. They just manage work. So we need to focus in on the trades and help them understand that they are part of a production cycle. And I love Todd's reference to work in, in, in process, not in progress, because it is that it, it's the, the, the science of construction is really the art of connecting things, right? And if you don't have a plan for understanding how you connect those things, and if you don't have an understanding of of how quickly you can connect those things to get the, the project done. You know, we are just wasting billions and billions of dollars that, that could go for much more important things. I noticed last week, to Dave Connell's credit, at Chevron, they've started to link executive compensation to meeting some global warming goals. So what if we started linking executive compensation at construction companies? to modern construction goals, productivity and safety were the two different, were the two things that you look at when you are leveraging executive compensation rather than writing in and saving a project that most of your people had a hand in messing up in the first place. And the final thing is that the one statistic I love in our business is that for every hundred trucks that show up on a construction site, there's 37 trucks behind them picking up trash from that site and taking it away. And that just seems criminal. So I'm, I'm really, ex I'm excited to be here and to continue my learning with, with Todd. I had him on the podcast and it's, it's my highest rated podcast so far because people are really starting to, to turn to what, what you're talking about, Gary, in terms of modern construction. So thanks for having me here.
Yeah, and I'll give a plug to that podcast if you our <laughs> listeners haven't heard about it or seen it. Uh, you could again connect it up with our website. That was an excellent interview and a very thought provoking provoking conversation that the two of you had. So Dave Connell, you've been on the front lines and seen it happen, made it happen, forced it to happen. I like that, you know, contractors create assumptions and then surprised when they don't come true. I've been there, done that. And I know you have as well. So what's your perspective on the, the need for capital projects in the energy sector to change, modernize, especially as companies like Chevron contemplate the energy transition? Yeah, so I'll start off just with a simple example. Many years ago, early in my career, back in 1984, I was working on a fertilizer plant and we had to buy a, a sulfuric acid plant as part of that. And so we went out to bid lump sum, three bids. Monsanto comes back clearly the winner, 20% cheaper, 20% faster, and they have data to show they can deliver on their promise. So what do we do? We take the number two bid because they complied with our liability and insurance requirements. <laughs> and they were using an engineering office where their, our plant was going to be the first plant that office had engineered as a grassroots plant. You can imagine how that went um, and what it did to the cost, the overall cost of our and, and schedule of our facility. But if you look at the energy business, our, what we do with projects is, you know, we're tasked with finding and developing a resource that's in the ground. Okay, so the energy that we sell already exists, right? The valuable thing is there, you know, worth a trillion dollars or whatever for a big one and, you know, whatever the amount of money it is there. And so quite often the, the cost of the project to get it out of the ground and into a pipe or onto a ship is relatively small compared to the value of the resource. So if we're inefficient in that project or in the development of the, of the, of the resource, it really doesn't hurt our overall economics. So particularly in the upstream part of our business, I think many times we were uh, lazy, I'd say, because it, it didn't overall impact the, the business, the bottom line of the business that much. And we do see you know, and like in our downstream and chemical businesses where they're working on a margin, their project performance typically is better than in the upstream side of the world. And then to your question there, Gary, about the, the transition. So if we look forward, you know, and what does the future look like in, in a carbon free world, carbon neutral world? We have to create the energy, right? Whether it's wind or solar or geothermal, the projects will be to both create the, the energy and then get it to, to the end customer. So now we're much more, we're more, the whole energy system is much more a margin business like downstream and chemicals. If we are not efficient and cost effective in delivering projects, we are going to be in trouble, I think. And we've seen, if you go back to my Monsanto example, you know, why? You know, I remember this very vividly. I was just furious that the lawyers decided, you know, who we were going to pick. And we couldn't go with the, the, obviously, the winning bid and the one that made the most sense. So that's understandable. But the thing that I didn't do and that our company didn't do was say to ourselves, well, how and why, how does Monsanto deliver their sulfuric acid plants so much faster and cheaper than everybody else. And if you think back a few minutes ago to Todd's little roadmap, Monsanto was like on step kind of three or four. They had standard designs. Monsanto had built 700, this is in 84, had built 700 sulfuric acid plants around the world. They had a little team of people and that's all they did. They had standard designs, they had standard suppliers, you could tell them, and this is like, you know, they would not change their contract, even if it meant losing the business. That's the way they did it. They, they knew how to deliver on time, on schedule, way better than anybody else. And, you know, they applied and they basically had a sulfuric acid plant factory that turned out 20 to 30 sulfuric acid plants a year. 
around the world. And almost every single one was on time and on budget. The only thing you told them was your feedstock and your product requirements. And we did not then look at that and say, how do we apply that thinking, right, to what we do in projects? You know, I mean, when I, when I do a project, you know, I'm going into a, a new country, a new company, new partners, new logistics, everything's unique. That's the way we look at it, right? Everything is bespoke. I have built 10 to 12 works of art around the world. Okay. They're beautiful. Right, everyone is totally unique, and kind of as Todd mentioned about steel work, you know, welded versus bolted. It's not just welded versus bolted, I got complex and simple connections, local or offshore fab. Do I want to have high tensile, low weight, go for cheaper steel, more weight? There's, there's a thousand decisions I can make just on making the steel, it's yeah. so much fun, right? But that comes to variability. We're just you know, because we're not doing things the same, we're not standardizing, we're not thinking with a production and a mindset. We, in, we introduce, you know, it is perfectly acceptable on our projects to put a billion dollars worth of materials on the ground for a couple of years while we wait for construction to consume them. Because the project is not charged for the time value of money, right? But the cost, then I have to build warehouses, I have to protect and preserve some of that material ages and has to be thrown away. So, you know, changing our mindset uh, to an operation science approach, thinking about production, we really need to do that. We have, Chevron has in a few instances, pockets of the company we've been able to manage to do that. And where we have, we've seen some some very, very interesting and stellar results. And we just need to get that spread more broadly, not just around the company, but I think as Jan mentioned at the very beginning, you can see what that would do for the world if, if, if we could get this to be much more broad, broadly encompassed. Yeah, so hold, hold that thought. I'm gonna come back to you, but I, I, I neglected to talk to our audience before we started this. If you've got questions for our panelists, uh, please, Drop a question in the Q&A. We're monitoring that. So we'll, we, if we have time, we'll work those in as we go here. So Dave, let's continue on with that thought. You know, that's, that's a great observation. I couldn't agree more. Why, why are we where we are? It, it feels like, you know, the, we're stuck in the <laughs> systems of the past. What's keeping us from changing? What's, it, it's so badly needed. Why hasn't it changed like other industries have? So that's an excellent question, one that we have wrestled with a bit. I think our project professionals that do this, as was mentioned earlier, they see the P6 schedule as what's going to happen, not what could happen. And they don't understand the difference between an aspirational schedule that something that could happen and then how do I take my that create a project execution plan and a production system that will deliver that schedule and then the metrics of your production system are, are different than the metrics you know progress and production are two different things okay and it baffles me because I we do this we are still doing it today you know we have our S curve that we start out with, and the slope of your S curve is your production rate in very broad terms. We get a little bit behind schedule, and so we replan, come up with some mitigations, and the slope of the curve gets steeper, but we still have the same end date, which means our production rate increased. Nobody asks, well, how, what did you do to increase the rate of production? I have a, a person I'm working with right now today who's getting to the end of a project and, and he's in trouble and he's now seeing production data that shows that he's handing over, you know, 50 systems a week. The plan is 100, or not the plan, the plan isn't even, it's more than 100. He's handing over 50, his forecast from his guys is 100. And he finally figured out he needs to go ask him, why are you forecasting for next week 
that you're going to complete 100 systems when for the last six weeks you've only been able to do 50. Yeah. What's going to be different? He is finally asking them production questions, right? But it, he's at the end of the at the end of the rope. It's too late. <coughs> you know we we bring project professionals in from all the ranks of engineering there are very few industrial i don't know if there are any i think there are two maybe industrial engineers in chevron nobody comes in with an operation science bit of training you know i was a chemical engineer when i started and you know the things i've done i often say to myself you know i don't remember that when i was back at the university of arizona Nobody taught me that. And so, but our background of most of our project professionals is not operation science. There's very few people that have that resource here to draw from. They basically learn on the fly how to do uh, project management. And so we also have a variety of approaches. Basically each individual does it their own way. So there's not even a standardization of how we manage a project in many aspects. You know, we basically award a contract and expect that to happen. We wonder why the contractor does the big stuff first and doesn't do the small stuff because we keep writing in there that that's the way he's going to get paid. Huh, I wonder what's motivating him. Instead of, you know, writing in there that the contractor, I'm going to pay you when this lump of work, I can have a lump sum contract, but I, I can stage my payments based on the sequence I want the work done yet, but we don't do that, right? For decades, we haven't done that. And then we always complain that the contractor does the work in what's his best interest, not in what's my best interest. But we don't structure the compensation that way. So there, there's just so many ways we are not looking at our project issues as production issues. Yeah, yeah. not seeing it as a production system is at the core. Uh, so, Xavier, uh, let's kind of ask you the same question, maybe slightly differently. It's fantastic that your company has recognized the need to modernize. But I say, why now? And what are the implications if you don't? That's a very good question, Gary. Like, as I stated, in order to make your work safe and competitive, we need to modernize. So what are the reasons? Why should we do that now? Why not later on? I'll give you a few examples with respect to our company and the place where I am in. Asri is a shipyard in Bahrain. Any modern technology, it attracts youngsters and improves localization. This is a very important component in this part of the world to train locals to them to have locals as a part of the work process, give them things which are very interesting. Modernization, automation, digitization, all these, they really are attractive to young youngsters. And that's the way a company can have fresh talent coming in and taking the organization forward. Second is I talked about safety a bit, ship repair is has to be a very safe operation. Now, that means to make it safer, we need to do the work away from the ship. Just imagine you have a tanker, you're doing a steel fabrication inside it, you've got a welder, cutter, etc., and then you have five safety personnel standing behind you to ensure that you know things are done safely. If there's a fire, how do you mitigate it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the need of the R is how do you do that? Can you take that job away from the ship and do it in the shop where things are in a much more controlled atmosphere? So that's the second part of it. The third part of it is skilled personnel in production. It's gonna be very, very difficult to find skilled person as we go. Take an instance, you have to sort of put in a new pipe spool into a ship. The owner has told you that you have to this pipe, we need a new pipe. So now if you look at the traditional way of doing things, you'll have a guy, you stage that place, you'll have a guy, you know, visualizing what's the route going to be out there. And then he, by hit and trial, he creates a spool and fits it in position. With today's technology, you can scan that place, 
you can go back to your office nicely route it fabricate it through a pipe bending machine put it on board you've made the operation so much more safer and simpler and you have also created a record of what you have done so this record is very important unless we have data for whatever we have done we don't know whether the work process we have created is optimal or not remember in the sort of industry we are in any particular work in a day we possibly work at hundreds of locations and to make a process optimal for all these locations you need to have data and to go back to your data and see how you optimize it so all this on this with a view to reduce cost and make your operation safe so the answer the simple answer is yes it has to be done now so you can be competitive and safe absolutely that's, that's the bottom line absolutely so dick you're you're a big voice for change in your in your world what's why have other industries modernized but not the building sector and what are the implications if it doesn't happen now well thanks for the the big voice comment i, I guess it's just not big enough <laughs> what's what's really interesting i think is you know paul Teckold's has told us for the last 15 years that <clears throat> that productivity in construction has lagged behind every other industry. So it's it's no it's 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 no um, news to anybody that that we continue to lag behind because we're not modernizing. But I think that the second part of your question is really much more important is that why aren't we doing it and what has to be done? What has to change? What's the paradigm shift that has to change? It really is a paradigm shift. We have to look at things differently. And yet we there's data out there. I, I really appreciate Dave's comment about every one of his projects is bespoke because knowledge has been gained, but it hasn't been shared. It hasn't been used. And it's as, as Xavier said, when you create data, you can use that data. Just, just think how much data we have from projects in the world that we have never synthesized and used to say, wow, there's a real problem here, right? We keep waking up the next day, like it's Groundhog Day and saying, oh, we got a new project. We're gonna have to invent a way to build it. We don't really have to invent a way to build it. I mean, we've been using stickies on the wall since Glenn and Greg started talking about the last planner system. And at Parkland Hospital, we reduced resources by 30% and finished 11 days early. That's a 2 million square foot hospital with $1.65 billion. We, we keep looking at, at things and trying to adjust for the symptoms. I think what Dave was talking about is the problem of looking at a schedule after 30 days and, and saying, well, we have a problem and now we're rallying around and we're trying to figure out how to recover from that. We're looking at, at trying to fix a symptom when the problem happened 90 days ago. So what we have to do is we have to make our production systems visible so if work that we thought was, was going to be in progress is not in process, we need to look at that right away. You know, that's the theory of constraints. We got to rally around that. We got to pull the end on court. We got to, we have to jump on it. We have to focus on whether we're meeting what those milestones are um, every time we're, we're trying to get them going in this. You know, one of our mantras <clears throat> has always been inventory is waste. And yet when Todd and I were talking, you know, a few months ago, he said, well, your, your project wants to be lean, but it doesn't want to be anorexic. Mm -hmm. So we need to start not only thinking about <clears throat> better ways to do this, but we need to think about analyzing them every single day and see whether they're working and using our plan, do act, act and, you know, plan, do check and adjust cycle <clears throat> so that everybody is tuning up the machine on a regular basis, because that carburetor and that 51 Chevy needs to be adjusted every single day and that's really what we're doing is we're driving a 51 chevy when we want to be driving electric cars or we want to get into into some kind of swiss tube you know swiss log pneumatic tube where i get from here to the hospital in like 11 seconds pneumatically you know we, we aren't thinking about things really broadly and and you know I, I think the covid crisis has pointed out to us how important the building industry is in the world there's so many people, not only in poverty, but don't have, you know, don't have buildings. That, there are indigenous tribes in, in Canada who don't have drinking water, who don't have the necessary shelter that they need in their communities. 
And this is a country, you know, the 33 million people in Canada, they've turned their attention to it and they can't seem to solve it because it always, it always seems like a political problem. It's not a political problem. We're working on a building right now for vaccine production and research that I have, it's gonna be, you know, 80,000 square feet. And I've said to the team, we can build this in eight months. And they're going, are you crazy? I said, no, we can just say, if we put our minds to it, we can figure out how to get this building built in eight months and operational in a year. And, and this, is, this is something, you know, vaccines don't roll out of that, that, that building until it's built and it's been certified and commissioned and all the rest of that stuff. And that's a problem that needs to be addressed right now. So I'm passionate about really taking operational science and operations science and trying to get it into these, in, you know, into the industry, and and the pressure in in my industry, really my part of the industry, is coming from the owners. Uh, it'd be really nice if the pressure came from the trades, the vendors, the contractors, the designers, instead of just the owners, because until people start making new offers in the marketplace, we're going to be stuck with what they have to offer. Well, that's a that's a really good point needs to come from more than just the owners, that, that pressure for change. <clears throat> Jan, from, from your perspective, what do you have to add here? Why, why, why are we so stuck in the past? Or why manufacturing is blown by construction, you know, many folds. Why are we stuck in the past? Uh, so, firstly, I think, I mean, we've spoken about this failure to appreciate that a product is a production system. But I venture to go one step further to say, which is that participants in a product don't recognize that they're actually together one single production system, right? Mm -hmm. So like even on an EPC lump sum contract, the production system will have participants from everyone involved in that same thing being dependent on each other's performance, right? To, to get it right. So that's one. And the second thing is, I think, and this also comes a bit through that survey as well, right? If we look at where we are as an industry, we're still stuck a bit in a, you know, a lowest bidder mindset. Now, we might not go with the lowest, we might go with the second, because the second one is still a little bit better than the lowest. So I'm not saying it's always the lowest, but there's a strong desire. And I think if I would almost make it an emotional thing, right, is we don't want to be the fool that got, you know, how do, how do I say politely? Yeah, that, that got the short end of the stick, yeah? <laughs> And so there's a strong focus on these penalties and incentives. And that's been driven in there for decades, right? Which then gets to kind of like a second point, which is the inertia, right? So the whole industry is trained in a traditional product management approach. That's the language we speak. That's the thing we understand. So managing risk and incentives in that structure, people understand it. If you want to go to, you know, production, operation, science, and that, it's a completely new domain, right? And if you fight for that, you might be considered the fool, you might be considered theoretical, you might be considered conceptual, right? You're, you're weird, yeah? And you can imagine if you're a consultant coming with that, it's even worse, yeah? Okay. But, so that's, that's another point. And then I think, I think the last thing is also to the point just made, made before, right? Players pointing towards each other. Again, in this survey, it was a very interesting. One third said, if you want to start modernizing construction, it's a joint effort. One third said it's a, it's the contractor, and one third said it's the owner. Right. So there's only there there is a, a there's a good part that recognizes something to do together, but there's still very much kind of like the mindset of why should I be paying for this? Right. Because the effort needed to modernize construction, yes, you need to invest, but rather than asking the question what you know why should I pay for this, isn't that their shouldn't they be doing that? I think a much more interesting and empowering question is, is how do I get the most return on this investment? Much more interesting, right? And I think that's where, uh, yeah, if, you know, if uh, the way I look at it, you know, it just holds massive value potential, but it requires bold visionaries, you know, that want to start from a, a mutual point of trust mm. in a contracting discussion that are extremely keen to learn right that actually want to understand the data in the daily production the daily execution that they want to know that 
and own that so that they can go into a contracting situation, actually discuss what are realistic production rates that are being put forward, guys, does this make sense? How can we actually achieve this together, right? And so that willingness to learn. And lastly, that are willing to challenge that status quo, right? And accept being called crazy for a while, yeah? But that are just willing to go against the grain on that. And I think that's what really will be needed is, like I said, these bold visionaries that, that you know, are willing to, to exhibit behavior that's yeah. a little atypical for the industry. Really good point. We're getting some great questions, by the way, that I'm, I'm yeah. going to lob at you guys here shortly. But before we before we take our first question, Dave, I want to give you, Dave McKay, uh, a chance to opine on the why haven't we changed before now? Yeah, I, I think the points that have been made are excellent. I guess all I can add to that is I think, well, it, as I mentioned in my in my in my first my first monologue there that that I was somewhat unburdened by knowledge from previous project management. And I think there is just a very kind of strong status quo that sits in place, especially in the construction industry that, that I found throughout, you know, throughout my, my, my career in that, in this part of the business that became some of the biggest resistors that we had to kind of work through. And I think that is actually a reality in both on the ownership side and especially out there on the, on the contractor side. And I think, and I think that also leads me to the comment that, you know, I think in the end, a lot of this change has to, has to start happening kind of in the C-suite of both the ownership and in the, and, and in the contractor realm where, some of this inherent resistance that sits in the ranks can that that's the only place it can really be overcome and what it what i mean by that is that people executives can't just delegate the details of how work is being done i mean you know ford and gm was doing a lot of that until you know really 2008 forced them into finally changing you know and c suite executives started becoming interested in what was going on on the production floor not just delegating it to uh, somebody down there that was going to get the work done. And they were, they were, you know, the C-suite folks were looking at spreadsheets and, and managing the numbers. I think it will take, you know, leaders at the highest levels on both the, in, in all parts of the industry to start, you know, getting interested in how the work gets done and, and, and understanding that, that this different way is uh, really got to become part of uh, how their business functions. That's a really good point. You, you jogged my memory when Todd and I got to visit the Ford operation and see how much they had changed after their near-death experience. They made a decision to standardize components. So everything that the customer doesn't feel, the non-customer facing components, they standardized. And to reinforce that, because engineers like to tinker and create things and make uh, beautiful inventions, they created C-suite metrics on the percent of things reused on each vehicle. So yeah. that went right yeah. from the top, right down to the ranks to saying, we are going to reuse these components. Uh, a simple key metric drove all kinds of really interesting behavior as we talked with them. So I, I so let's go back to, to questions. I got a great question for you, Dave Connell. says, you mentioned the example about Monsanto, which was decades ago, but today we are competing against players from Asia, including China and Korea, which use a similar approach, standardized production approach. How can we compete as an industry if we do not change as an industry? Where do we start the change from the owner's or the contractor's perspective? To me, that's a simple question. I think the kind of comes to what Dave Mackay just said, it has to start with the and what you just said, Gary, about you know Ford. If the C-suite is not measuring and looking at the right things and asking the right questions and creating the right expectations, then people are going to continue to do what they've been doing, what they're comfortable with doing, what they know how to do, regardless really of what the outcome is. And you know, I had an example, uh, you're fully aware of it, Gary, that 
we had a pipeline failure on the first day of startup of a facility and it shut down the facility. So now I've got billions of dollars on the ground ready to go and we're not making any money because this little problem. And the vice chairman calls and says, he's asking for a schedule. He just wanted to know when are we gonna be making oil, right? And so we didn't look at this as we need to create a schedule. We looked at the problem and I don't know why we approached it this way, but it was, we need to put together a production system. We had basically installed 15 kilometers of injection pipelines incorrectly and it basically required we had to dig them up daylight them all the, the whole pipeline had to be daylighted in the trench straightened out and then reburied properly this was an interesting little specification and we had to do this in Kazakhstan in January and all of the pipelines were below the water table and you're not allowed to do compaction when it's freezing so it was a tricky thing. And if I'd used the schedule and normal P6 approach, I don't know how many months it would have taken, but we got the first two pipelines up in two months and the rest of them up in four and another two months and, and up and running because we put together a production system of, you know, here's the first step. And we just had, it was like a, a production line that moved down the pipe doing the work. And we started with the, and we, and we managed our work in process. We didn't know we were doing that, but we figured out, well, let's start with the simplest, easiest pipelines first that are the easiest ones to fix and get them done and on stream, take some pressure off our backs. That's, that's no longer work in process. Those two pipes were making money, right? We didn't think about it as work in process, but that's essentially what we were doing. So because we were faced with a, a totally different situation than a norm. It was, it was a project, but the, the pressure, the, the approach was completely different than normal project approach. We approached it from a production situation mindset without knowing that. So it, that tells me, and I've seen this many times, the people are capable of doing it. It's not that hard. We're, it, you know, it's not rocket science. I can't remember who was the aerospace engineer, but It, it's, it's, it's easy to do, but the resistance, and it really comes down to, and I've seen this time and time again in all, everything I do is you get what you measure. And so if we're measuring the right things, we will get the right performance. Yeah, I mean, it's as simple point. as that. Very good point. Any you know, panelists want to add anything? Well, I, I guess I just want to, you know, I mean, that's exactly what I was describing, uh, Dave's experience, what I was describing when I first encountered all this, all these concepts uh, where nobody wanted to see an S-curve, you know, they wanted to see oil online. So my, my challenge was to get a well online, you know, and then another one, and then another one. And yeah. so, you know, all the batch drilling and all the brilliant ideas I'd had about batching and, you know, that seemed so smart where uh, I had to throw them out the window though and actually just start focusing on, let's get one out the door and make it produce. Yeah. And so the Dave story reminds me of a, of a hotel that I worked on in a major American city that was supposed to be the headquarters for the, for the Super Bowl one year. And the schedule said that they were going to finish in April of the year that the Super Bowl was going on when the Super Bowl happens in February. So that, that really wasn't going to work. They were so wrapped around the P6 schedule and they called me in in April. So from April until December, we only had, we had, we had to take five months out of a 12 month schedule in, in seven months. And so I didn't think of this as taking any time out of the schedule. I thought of this as a, as a production problem. How do we, how do we divide up the place? Where do we put the superintendents that we need to have? So instead of having two zones, we had nine zones. We had stickies all over the wall everywhere. And we had, the first bud in a bed in, uh, in the middle of December. So we were able to do it by reorganizing our thinking around how work was going to be put in place and not about whether we were meeting the schedule or not. Yeah, so there's no doubt. If you want to compete, this is the way to get there. Modernized construction, thinking about production systems, being intentional about it. Jan, uh, I got one question for you. 
says the current owner contractor relationship is all about allocation of risk rather than productivity. How do we change that dynamic? Yeah, so for me, I think what Dave was, was mentioning, it does start with the definition of success for a contract and procurement effort, right? So what is success in contracting? That's one. And that needs to be something that is C-suite defined. And I think the second thing, and that's what we see clients do, is increasingly clients are looking at their portfolios of projects and actually making them into thematic sub-portfolios and then actually going for portfolio contracting, right, to make it more interesting for contractors to actually invest, co-invest, whatever the proposal is, Mm -hmm. right, to drive the learning curve within a micro portfolio. And then the competitive element remains because a contractor is then incentivized to, to bid also on a another portfolio, like in another micro portfolio or another micro. So it's the, the competition to ensure you get fair prices is not within the unit of a project, but in the unit of a micro portfolio, right? So that's something that we see coming up. Then I think there's also a mindset shift, which is when you're doing contracting, you're selecting a partner, not a contractor. Okay, I think that's also, if, if, if people can really take that to heart, you go in differently as well, right? Then another way to do it is, you know, creating a value pool. And this was a very interesting concept, obviously, that comes from the IPD contracting, uh, which I saw in for, for, for a hospital in, in San Francisco was, you know, creating a shared upside value pool that gets shared pro rata if we outperform, right? So if we improve and make each other's lives better, that shared pot gets bigger. And if we collectively fail, then it becomes collectively smaller, but there's a shared incentive to actually outperform. But it needs to not be on a one-to-one basis between a contractor and owner, but it needs to be across the subcontractors and main contracts that are involved. Right? And, then the other, and then the last thing I would argue is rather than an owner depending on bids to become smart on potentially realistic production rates in a particular region, like if an owner actually understands what realistic production rates are because they've tracked it using, mm-hmm. you know, the production thinking in the past, then you're actually trying to have a discussion with the contractor, which is what is a realistic bid based on facts and data, not, you know, your back is up against the wall, we're just going to accept it or whatever, but that you actually have a real conversation around what a de-risked competitive bid looks like that protects the contractor's profit margin while protecting your schedule and cost aspiration, right? And to have a really mature conversation around that. But because as an owner, you know, you want, you, know, you have an understanding, right? That, that's the difference because then you can actually have that conversation. So those are some thoughts maybe oh, on how you can start. I feel like that's a fastball right down my, right at me, Gary, because we're talking about the IPD projects and uh, IPD form of contract. And that was really something that, you know, came out of LCI and the work that was done very early on. And we're using those forms of agreement in, in Canada. And, and really to Jan's point, it's you absolutely can't build a vaccine facility in eight months unless you're using a collaborative contract, a relational contract of some kind. Uh, just think how much bidding costs us in the world. There's a, every contractor has 20% of their, their annual cost are are setting up these uh, you know systems to go chase bids find bids make bids do all the rest of that stuff and it, it's driven by really two things one this kind of false assumption that you can sell risk to individuals to the little pieces and parts of the project and the second one that, that there is some owner guilt here where where they think we might be able to get a building for actually less than it costs if we really went to market we might be able to really put somebody up against the wall. So I, I think, you know, Ian McNeil had been working on this since the 1970s on relational contracting. And we just have to refocus our efforts in the contracting field to get back to what Ian McNeil was talking about in terms of uh, a relationship. And what Johan said, you know, your, your partners out there. And there is data available to be able to see whether rates are reasonable and, and what's happening in the market. So it's, it is not that hard of a, hard of a turn. So. Sorry to jump in, but it just felt like it was <laughs> hey, uh, right, 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 in my, right in my wheelhouse. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Thank, thank you all. I, I want to take, we just have a few minutes left here. 
I just want to ask the panelists for one thing. You're all on different points in your journey to modernize construction based on your personal experience. What's the one thing that you would provide as advice to our listeners along that journey? And so, Jan, let's come back to you and start with you. Yeah, so my one advice, I mean, uh, just go for it. Just do it. Like the Nike slogan. I mean, it's like, that's it. Just try it. Dave Connell. Yeah. You need metrics and leadership expectations. Dave McKay. Yeah, I, I think get get started doing it. And, it's, and the earlier you do it, the better. But if it's late in the project, still start doing it. Excellent. Xavier. You'll be better off. Think about the next generation, the youngsters, you know, and make sure you digitize, make the job more interesting for them. That's a that's a very good point, because it, you know, if we don't have people coming into our industry. It's going to be a pretty tough industry. We think it's tough now. It's going to be really tough without people working in it. Absolutely. And Dick, what's your one thing? I think my one thing uh, I've learned from having to, having tried to boil the ocean is you have to take people where they are and inspire them to go to a different place. Excellent. Well, those, man, that there's a lot packed in this, those one answers there for folks to think about. I'm going to have to replay this and write those down and ponder on those a bit. So I want to thank you all for your time and freely giving of your advice and your experience to our audience. Thanks again. And Roberto, we're going to give you get it back to you with just a couple minutes to spare. Thanks for the opportunity, Gary. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gary.